All right, everyone. Well, welcome to the October version of the JVS Online Journal Club. We're excited to have everybody here. Very excited to have our sponsoring institutions, Lenox Hill Hospital and University of Florida, to discuss two articles uh, tonight, trends in the use of cerebrospinal drains and outcomes related to spinal cord ischemia after thoracic endovascular aortic repair and complex endovascular aortic repair in the VQI database, and also evaluation of revascularization benefit quartiles using the wound infection and foot infection ischemia and foot infection classification system for diabetic patients with chronic limb threatening ischemia. We have our two institutions tonight from Lenox Hill Hospital, Dr. Alan Conway, who is an assistant professor of surgery and the program director for the vascular surgery residency. And joining him also is a fourth year resident, Dr. Samuel Lee. From the University of Florida, we have Dr. Cooper, who is an assistant professor of surgery and their second year fellow, Dr. Uh, Libby Weaver. We're also thrilled to have our author guests tonight um, from John Hopkins University, Dr. Caitlin Hicks, who is an associate professor of surgery to director of research at their multidisciplinary diabetic foot and wound service. And also Dr. Chris Abularaj, who is the um, Bertrand and Ben Hine associate professor of surgery and the director of the diabetic foot and wound service. He's also the fellowship director. Dr. Alan Beck is also joining us from the University of Alabama. He is the professor and division chief um, for vascular and endovascular surgery. As always, we have two special guests who are nationally recognized and we're thrilled to have Dr. Tom Forbes joining us um, from the University of Toronto. He is a professor and chair of the division of vascular surgery there. And of course, Dr. Joseph Mills, Professor and Division Chief of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery from Baylor College of Medicine. Just a couple of housekeeping things. We do ask that you stay muted. You can put your questions and comments in the chat um, for the discussion leaders to go over those or to have them answered by the authors and also for a general discussion. This event is being recorded. It is on demand for trainees that are not able to make it. And of course, we'll have our November JVS Online Journal Club. It'll be on November 9th at 7 p.m. Easter time, where we'll have Cedar sinai and Indiana University that are sponsoring that. So I will stop sharing my screen and we will let Dr. Conway take it away. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's sharing and should be all working. So yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Paul, Misty, and the JVS for hosting tonight's uh, Journal Club. I've been attending these for a few months and they've, they've been uh, really excellent sessions and great discussions. So thank you for, for putting these on. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about uh, a paper looking at the trends in the use of uh, CSF drains and outcomes related to spinal cord ischemia uh, after TVAR and complex EVAR that use the uh, Vascular Quality Initiative. Spinal cord ischemia uh, remains uh, a third complication of a TVAR and complex EVAR with rates in the current literature reported anywhere from 2 to 11%. And that really depends on the pathologic indication for repair, the clinical presentation, as well as the aortic coverage length. The development of spinal cord ischemia really uh, remains an anatomically focused issue. Spinal cord perfusion is dependent on the vertebrosa of clavian arteries, branches from the thoraco and abdominal aorta, as well as the hypogastric arteries. The segmental arterial occlusion uh, leads to the development of spinal cord ischemia, and the recent evaluation has questioned whether there's a single solitary artery, and it's now widely understood to be based on a complex uh, collateralized network. Animal models uh, looked at the use of spinal drains, and that dates all the way back to the uh, 1960s, with work from uh, Denton Cooley amongst, uh, amongst others. What they found through their animal models to operating on uh, uh, dogs and pigs back in, uh, in the 60s was that when they uh, cross-clamped the aorta, the spinal fluid pressure uh, rose tremendously. And what they found in their animals was that the uh, spinal cord ischemia rate and paraplegia rate was close to 
through the studies uh, back then, they found that by draining the uh, spinal fluid, uh, they could really significantly reduce the incidence of paraplegia. And the theoretical conclusion at that time uh, was that a reduction in the spinal fluid pressure led to a significant pressure gradient, which maintained perfusion uh, to the spinal cord. The routine use of uh, spinal drains is now widely adopted for the uh, open surgical treatment of Crawford uh, 1 and 2 thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysms. However, the routine use has not been uh, widely accepted for uh, thoracic uh, endovascular procedures as well as complex endovascular procedures. That relates to spinal cord ischemia being much uh, lower of incidence in uh, endovascular approaches. And there is a significant morbidity as well as an associated mortality with the use of uh, uh, spinal drains. Right now, the recommendations from the Society for Vascular Surgery, as well as the European Society, is that prophylactic CSF drainage uh, can be used in cases that are deemed high risk. And that typically looks at extensive length of coverage or previous uh, aortic surgeries. Current CSF protocols amongst institutions really fall into one of three categories. That is either the routine preoperative use uh, in most patients, a lot of institutions will use selective periop placement for high-risk patients, those with previous aortic surgeries or, or deemed to be high risk for, for other reasons, or just strict post-op therapeutic uh, placement for patients that develop spinal cord ischemia. With that being said, I'd like to hand over to Sam Lee, who's our uh, fourth year integrated resident, who's going to carry on and uh, discuss the paper. So thanks again. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Conway, and uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak here tonight and uh, help discuss this paper. Uh, I'm Sam Lee. I'm the PGY4 uh, integrated resident from Lenox Hill Hospital, um, and oops, and uh, as Dr. Humphreys and Dr. Conway mentioned, the paper we'll be discussing is the trends in uh, uh, CSF drains and outcomes in uh, uh, TVARs and uh, complex endovascular repairs. Um, this is out of the uh, University of Alabama and the University of Florida. Um, so a little um, more about the background, um, as Dr. Conway mentioned, spinal cord ischemia, um, again, can be a really devastating complication of thoracic and complicated endovascular repairs, um, as you said, up to an 11% um, complication rate, depending on the uh, indication length of coverage. Um, just to review again, uh, preoperative um, CSF drainages have been used, uh, are being used routinely in open thoracal abdominal repairs, not so much in um, uh, endovascular repairs and some of the complications that uh, he had uh, referred to include intracranial hemorrhages, epidural hematomas, um, and some of the hesitancy is also due to the associated costs and resources uh, with CSF drain placement. Um, so the objective of this paper was to uh, identify trends in the usage and compare the outcomes related to the timing of CSF drain placement among patients who had developed spinal cord ischemia despite pro, uh, uh, preoperative prophylactic CSF drain placement compared with those who developed ischemia with a post-op therapeutic CSF drain placed. In terms of the methods, this was a retrospective review of the VQI database from 2014 to 2019 with the inclusion criteria being elective TVARs or complicated EVARs of a degenerated aneurysm. Uh, exclusion criteria included um, those patients with ruptured aneurysms, uh, those who were treated emergently, or those with non-aneurysmal pathology, such as a dissection, trauma, or, or PAU. Um, also excluded were patients who uh, got post-operative uh, post prophylactic drain placement. Um, uh, the, the authors analyzed the length of coverage, incidence of uh, spinal cord ischemia, and their recovery um, during their hospital stay. And in terms of results, uh, this is their table one. Uh, there was a total cohort of about 3,400 patients uh, when looking at uh, who got drains when, uh, the pre there were about 1,000 patients who got uh, preoperative prophylactic drains placements, 24 patients who got postoperative therapeutic drain placements, and uh, uh, 2,300 patients who had, who had no drain placement. Um, in terms of uh, demographic differences, uh, some differences were that there was a significantly greater rate of uh, uh, CAD in, post -op in the postop therapeutic group. And in the pre-op uh, prophylactic group, there was a history of a, a, a prior aortic surgery repair. In terms of figures three and four on the left, we see uh, the uh, temporal trends of uh, spinal cord ischemia uh, as uh, tracked during this paper from 2014 to 2018, there was a decrease um, 
uh, in the rates of spinal cord ischemia from 4.5% to 1.4% in 2018 for an overall ischemia rate of 2.3%. Um, this is despite uh, the fact that there were no changes in the placement of prophylactic uh, uh, spinal cord drains. Um, that we see that image on the, uh, on the right, uh, the figure four. There's no change in pre-op uh, prophylactic drain placement, um, but in terms of therapeutic drain placement postoperatively, there was a significant difference from five to 1%. Looking at the spinal cord ischemia cohort, uh, there were 72 total patients with 48 of those patients getting preoperative prophylactic placement. The, again, the uh, prophylactic group uh, were more likely to have prior aortic surgery and there were no other significant diff differences, but there were tr uh, some trends to note. There were more females, uh, current smokers and diabetics and uh, patients with a history of uh, coronary interventions in the post-op therapeutic group. Um, whereas in the pr uh, prophylactic group, there were more rates of uh, cerebrovascular disease and a history of cabbage. In terms of the perioperative factors, the preoperative prophylaxis group was more likely to have IVIS used during the case. And it's noted that this could be that, um, uh, as we saw in the prior tables, they may have a history of aortic surgery, may have more complex anatomy. Um, and the post-op therapeutic group was more likely to have uh, post-operative MIs. Um, again, no significance, but there was a trend towards a higher mortality uh, in the post-op therapeutic group. Uh, looking at their table four, um, which is a, an important part of this paper, this track the, um, uh, the outcomes of the, of the paraplegia that the, these patients experienced. And they found that uh, there was a 54% uh, of patients with permanent paraplegia in the prophylactic group versus a 79% um, uh, paraplegia rate in the uh, therapeutic group. And this was significant uh, with a p-value of 0 .04. Uh, uh, and looking at uh, um, uh, survival uh, at one year after surgery, the uh, prophylactic group had a higher one-year survival at about 71% compared to 50, around 50% for the therapeutic group. And looking at the multivariable analysis, um, uh, uh, the authors found that the permanent paralysis was uh, independently associated with uh, an extent to aneurysmal coverage um, versus uh, a type four, um, as well as post-operative CSF drain placement. So in terms of the discussion, this paper um, confirms the severity of uh, spinal cord ischemia and its impact on mortality. Um, uh, they cite some papers um, that say that uh, there's about an 87% uh, survival at one year um, in patients without spinal cord ischemia, and this is compared to about 60 or uh, 60 and 48% in uh, our groups in this paper. Um, uh, as noted, the spinal cord ischemia rates have uh, declined over the past uh, a few years, um, but in patients with spinal cord ischemia, uh, improved neurologic outcomes uh, and mortality with uh, uh, pre-op prophylactic placement. Um, however, there really are no practice guidelines to standardize which patients exactly may be at high risk for a spinal cord ischemia. Um, I found that uh, there are greater rates of uh, pre-op drain placement with priority surgery and lower um, spinal cord ischemia rates uh, may show that we are getting a little better at identifying these high-risk patients. Uh, in terms of some limitations in future directions that the, the authors mentioned, this was a, a retrospective review of a large database, uh, which is prone to variability and uh, data availability. Um, there was also no specific information on drain placement or management or the uh, exact mechanism of the ischemia or the uh, specific drain complications that may have, um, uh, may have arisen. Um, there also may be a bias towards uh, patients with prophylactic placements as they have, uh, may have been more closely monitored in the ICU. This is compared to patients uh, without drains for which uh, uh, spinal cord ischemia may be underreported. Um, so given all of this, uh, um, this really warrants future randomized studies to evaluate who may benefit the most from uh, drain placement. So in conclusion, um, ischemia rates have decreased over time, uh, though the use of uh, prophylactic drainage has not changed. Um, and among uh, spinal cord ischemia patients, those with post-op therapeutic drain placement fared worse uh, with higher rates of permanent paralysis uh, and increased mortality at one year. Thank you. Tom, do you want to start us off yeah, on the discussion? Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Humphrey. So, just a couple of comments, and please, um, please, people, comment, uh, type your comments into the chat there if you have some questions. So, I think, you know, Dr. Conway and Dr. Lee did a, gave, an, gave an outstanding um, summary of this paper, and commend Dr. Beck and his group for the usual very mature and excellent analysis of the, of this database. Um, exemplary work as usual, Adam. Congratulations. Um, so I, when I when I read this paper and looking at it that it's a VQI analysis, um, you know a couple things um, stick out to me. Number one is uh, 
overall, the paraplegia rate was, or the spinal cord complication rate was relatively low at only 2.3% when you look at the entire cohort of over 10,000 patients. And we remember that the in-depth analysis is really of a, quite a small group of that over, overall number. It's only of 72 patients. Those patients that had a spinal cord complication and either had a prophylactic preoperative drain placed or a salvage drain placed following that. It, as Dr. Lee said, it excluded certain pathologies, so we can't translate these results into those patients who suffer from blood thoracic aortic injury, chronic dissections, or isolated pathologies like PAUs and, and, and IMHs. That being said, there are some sobering results here. It just reaffirms what we know. Uh, paraplegia and spinal cord complications is bad. It's bad for the cord. We don't, we don't salvage a lot of these patients. And also, it translates into de decreased survival, both perioperatively and at one year. It was sobering that post-spinal um, cord ischemia, or a, a drain that was placed prior to somebody suffering from ischemia at a 60% one-year survival, where it was 48% if we tried to salvage it with a, a drain afterwards. Um, we have to remember it because it's a registry registry report that these are associations and not necessarily cause and effect. And one of the big the big things that come out of these papers, for me at least, is the hypothesis that are generated, the other questions. And for all the residents and, and young surgeons on the line, this is just a, a, a ripe area for further research. So some of the questions that come up for me that I still don't know the answer to is, something simple like what is the mechanism of spinal cord ischemia and does it differ between patients who undergo open and endovascular repair? What's the role of embolization of that thrombus to the intercostal arteries in, in um, endo repair? I don't think we entirely know whether there's a similar role of CSF drainage in endo or open repair. Um, certainly, I think it's more should be more selective an endo repair and maybe more uniformly used in open repair, but I don't think we know that yet. Remember when we talk about CSF drainage, we're only talking about one adjunct for spinal cord protection. And a lot of us use obviously blood, blood pressure management. Personally, I do when a patient is on, I'd be interested in what Dr. Beck does. When a lot of our patients are on antihypertensives, what I usually do is I stop their antihypertensives and I half their beta blocker preoperatively. Um, because I want them running running a little high. Uh, we do liberally use spinal drains um, preoperatively. Pharmacologic measures have not been met with a lot of success, but you still, anecdote, hear, still hear anecdotal reports of steroid use and naloxone and our barbiturates, and there are some newer pharmacologic agents that are, that are being tried. Um, well, maybe I can start off with a question maybe for Adam. What do you do preoperatively with um, antihypertensives or, or medical regimen? Thanks, Tom, and um, thanks everyone for having us and, and choosing our paper. It's really an honor to have it presented here, um, Missy and Paul. I appreciate it, the, and Sam, excellent job summarizing the paper. Thank you. Uh, there, there's a lot to talk about here, and I, but Tom, to just specifically talk about uh, to answer your question preoperatively, we do we we have a, a pretty defined um, spinal cord ischemia protocol, which we we published. Um, I think it was in 2015 and in a fair amount of detail with some minor adjustments since that paper was published in the JVS. Um, we do hold blood pressure medications preoperatively except for beta blockers. Uh, we do keep patients on those and we usually hold it uh, uh, two days before the procedure. So we let them be permissively hypertensive. Um, and, I, and I just to, to maybe emphasize something that you said is that spinal cord ischemia prevention is not just the drain. I think everybody really focuses on the drain, but there is so much more to it. And to the, there, there are some excellent questions in the chat, but to some of the, to the point of some of these questions is that um, the reason the, the rate of spinal cord ischemia has decreased over time, in my opinion, is because people are doing a better job of mitigating all of the other you know, risk factors for this. I think we understand the, it a lot better than we do did previously when we were doing just open repair um, or staging repairs where uh, we're, we try to get our, our sheaths out more quickly so the patients have perfusion to their hypogastrics and their legs. Uh, we keep their hemoglobin up. We manage their blood pressure better as you just highlighted. Um, so I think there's a lot 
you know, I know that there's a lot more to it than, than just the drain, but there's also a lot of nuance to the drain itself. And, um, and we can certainly talk more about that. Yeah, Dr. Conway brings up the concept of sort of the timing of the therapeutic drain following an event. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that sort of cloud our physical exam. The patient may still be under GA. We not be, may not be able to do an appropriate exam. Um, just like time is brain, time is time is cord. So probably an individual institution strategy is probably dictated by the availability of getting a drain in, you know, in the evening or on, or, or on weekends. Um, but also the complication rate, right? And, um, you know, I, 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 I certainly had cases where I've had a, an all day case canceled because the drain goes in and there's a bloody, there's a bloody tap, basically. There's a bloody drain. I don't know if anybody else, um, Dr. Abias, are you nodding your head? You've had that as well. And other complications from drains? Or the well, the, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of, in the literature recently, the, the best paper that I know is in the, um, I think it's in the British Journal of Anesthesia that's about complications of spinal drains, but it's pretty interesting if you look, and then we can echo this with our local results when we just had a poster at the SVS a year ago, is that the rate of, of um, complications is about 6%. Of serious complications. Of course, you can define that a little differently. Um, sometimes people include spinal headache in there, which I don't consider a serious complication, but um, you know, epidural hematomas, intracranial bleeds uh, of various uh, uh, severity. Um, it's very similar across all of the papers. And I think that if you look at these numbers, we have decreased the rate of spinal cord ischemia to the point that there's, that there's um, you might say there's equipoise um, with pre-operative drains versus um, post-operative drains. And I think it kind of begs for a randomized controlled trial at this point. The, um, and, I, and I'm, I'm wandering a little bit, and I apologize, but I, I do want to highlight one thing that you said, uh, Misty's smiling at me because I am, I am wandering. Uh, one of the things that you said I'll maybe highlight is that um, the the whole reason we wrote this paper was because of the idea that you know do do you really believe that spinal drains prevent spinal cord ischemia by what Alan pointed out earlier by decreasing inter, the intraspinous pressure and increasing perfusion we don't really know that that's how we theorize that it works but even if it doesn't do that is there some benefit of having the drain in place when the event occurs and you can immediately open it. Um, and I, I think there is. And so, so if, you know, I hear people all the time at meetings say, well, we can, you know, we have people on call, we can put a drain in in 30 minutes. That it, I will save my four letter yeah. words for, for you, but that is not true. Uh, it, it, at the best of places, it, it probably takes two hours to mobilize the troops, get them there, get everything together, get the drain in at best would be two hours. And so you know, as you pointed out, the time is tissue, you know, time is, is uh, axons. And, and I think that, um, that, that um, we really, you know, pro probably need to keep that in mind. And, and uh, to someone else's point, that may be different for different centers, you know, maybe, maybe it's different at, um, you know, at a place that, that does have people on call, a neurosurgery resident or something that can do it right away versus a place that does, you know, one spinal drain every six months. And, and, you know, those patients get, those patients get washed out in the thousands of patients in the BQI registry. You don't realize that they, you know, that, that they really didn't have a chance. Right. And just in the chat for everybody, Will Jordan uh, reminds us that there was another JVS publication that Gustavo Odrich um, wrote in the last, uh, in the short time period, last year or so that really highlighted the complications of, of CSF drains and I think gave a lot of people caution about sort of routinely using it in every in every in every patient. And their um, their rate of their rate, I'm sorry to interrupt, but their rate of, yeah. of um, the patients having uh, serious intracranial bleeds that required a craniotomy, uh, I think was like two percent or something like that. Um, the, the, you know, a lot of these patients get intraventricular hemorrhage, which is really no consequence. You see bloody, bloody blood in the drain and get a CT and they have no neurologic manifestations of it other than a headache or a subarachnoid hemorrhage, not, not to downplay those things, but, um, they are, you know, that's not the same as getting your head opened up in a, in a hematoma drained or getting a laminectomy and a hematoma right. drain. So, 
right. I think we probably need, you know, there's some nuance to that too that we should point out. Right. So Misty and Paul cut me off, but I, when we're time for the next paper, but I just maybe want to ask Dr. Conway as a program director, you know, what, what do you folks teach your residents at your center about the indication for CSF drain when we start talking about aortic, you know, length of aortic coverage, coverage of key vessels, those, those types of things? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Forbes. It's a good question. You know, we, um, we, we will typically kind of do similar stuff to what uh, Dr. Beck was saying in terms of holding antihypertensives for a few days before. We'll typically let them run hypertensive for at least six weeks post-op. Uh, you know, we, there, are, there are those delayed spinal cord ischemias that we've had over the years that are really kind of troubling for, for everyone. You think you've got them through the, the case. But in terms of for the, for the, the residents, you know, it's, it's extent of aortic coverage and prior aortic surgery, which is the two kind of key things um, for us in terms of placing the, uh, the preoperative spinal drains. Now, I think just for a regular TVAR, if you're looking at kind of zone four coverage, you probably don't need it. But when you start encroaching on that, uh, you know, lower thoracic upper lumbar level to the artery of, at Amquits, you know, whether it's solitary artery, I don't believe it's more of a, a complex, but I think, you know, if you start getting down to that level, that's when we sort of will start uh, getting the, uh, the pre-op drains placed. I think I kind of make the point, you know, as, as you say, and it's, it's commented, to get a post-op spinal drain does not happen immediately. Um, and then I think that's kind of the key, the key reason that, that's pointed out in this paper, why the results are what they are, that, you know, overnight and at weekends to get the, the neuro team to place those drains, even the best of centers uh, takes time. It's just, you know, getting personnel involved and getting the procedure does, uh, uh, certainly does take time. So that's where I think, you know, we, we should be better at identifying the pre-op high-risk patients. Um, and that's kind of what we, uh, what we teach residents. I think the other key thing is the, the post-op vigilance in the non-drained patient or the patient with the drain that's been capped as to, to what symptoms to look for. And, you know, we've over the years sadly had cases where, you know, you, you come in in the morning and say, well, the patient was moving the feet and say, well, they can't lift the legs off the bed. So it's, you know, really making sure that the overnight team and the, the rotating junior residents and the rotating, rotating PAs that cover the service really make sure the patients are lifting the legs off the bed as a true test of, uh, of strength of the legs if there's any symptoms developing. Well, that's 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 helpful. Maybe I can ask maybe Adam and maybe Dr. Hicks. You know, from the methodological perspective, you know, this is a large large registry, and there's lots of pros, you know, pros and cons. But when we start to think about sort of some some self-reported outcomes, like degree of paraplegia for or degree of spinal cord complications, or some of the other things, um, what sort of things do you think about as you're as you're designing these these studies? Maybe start with Adam and then maybe Dr. Hicks, who's, a, who's an expert in this area. Um, well, it's all, you know, data entry errors and um, people not entering their data properly is always a concern in a, in a registry like this, especially when you're using this as a quality measure where, uh, measure where you might actually be looked at and compared uh, across centers. Of course, that's all done um, anonymously, but nonetheless, we, we're all driven to have uh, to have the best numbers uh, when we look at this. So there are, you know, we've never actually in, in the VQI for this particular issue, we've never actually um, audited the, the data. There would be some ways to audit it. For example, looking at uh, length of stay, you know, after, after branch fenestrator repair, you know, if a patient had a really long length of stay and there were no complications entered, you could easily audit that patient. We've actually done something like that before with, um, with uh, myocardial infarction and AAA, and we audited um, look, based on length of stay it, um, and, and came up with a, a group of patients that had a high risk for MI, but did not have an MI documented and had a long length of stay. And we found a, you know, an additional percent or, or percent and a half of, of um, MIs that weren't documented there. So there's certainly, I'm, I'm absolutely certain there are probably some spinal cord ischemia events that were not entered uh, and, you know, I've personally reviewed publications before where uh, when patients died, uh, people did not document that they had spinal cord ischemia when they, you know, when they did their, their analysis, which is, is kind of silly to do because, you know, spinal cord ischemia rarely runs alone. You know, it's all, it's it, it, rarely do you just have a patient who has SCI and that's it. They, you know, it's very commonly that, you know, I had one just last week and she, or two weeks ago, she had an MI. 
and had spinal cord ischemia from, you know, a low perfusion. And, um, I would say that's more common than, you know, having it alone. So, um, anyway, it's always a concern. And I think, you know, I think that, that you have to temper your, you know, temper your, um, interpretation of the results a little bit because of that. And we always put that in the limitations of the paper. Sure. Yeah. Often a series of unfortunate events, right? Um, Dr. Hicks, any sort of just brief sort of cautionary tales around registry databases and, you know, this type of investigation? Yeah, I mean, I think Adam brings up most of the sort of the major points is it's, is it, you know, a non-audited database and you're sort of relying on people for data entry. Um, the definition of SCI at one institution might not be the same as at another institution. So it's important to sort of think about that. And then I think sort of a larger problem, which is, you know, not just VQI specific, but really any sort of retrospective study specific is that there's a huge selection bias in these patients. So the people who got spinal drains, you probably got them for a reason. You know, they're higher risk patients. You can see that in the table one and two that was reported in Adam's paper. Um, so you sort of have to try to weed through that a little bit to understand whether the differences in outcomes reflect the actual thing that you're studying versus just a baseline difference in the, in the cohorts that you're looking at. Um, so I think, you know, Adam did a very nice job here sort of look, walking through this in various iterations and, you know, trying to sort of convince the readers and, and the, as makes it a, wonder, a great paper um, that it's, it's not just a reflection of sort of baseline differences in disease, but it is something you have to think about when you're designing a study like this. I think that's really great to kind of move us into the next paper, which is yours actually, Dr. Hicks. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Forbes, for, for leading that discussion, Dr. Beck. Um, Dr. Conway and Dr. Lee just doing a great presentation. So I think we'll have Dr. Cooper go ahead and get us started. Okay. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so good evening and thank you for the opportunity to present on the Hicks and Pularaj paper on the evaluation of revascularization benefit quartiles using the Wi-Fi classification system for diabetic patients with C uh, LTI. Uh, so critical limb ischemia was first defined in uh, 1982 to delineate a subgroup of patients with uh, threatened lower extremities secondary to ischemia with the intended exclusion of diabetic patients, which were considered a separate higher risk patient population. However, in modern series of patients undergoing revascularization, up to 80% of CLTI patients are diabetic, suggesting the need for an updated classification system. In current practice, patients with CLTI present with a broad spectrum of underlying factors, of which ischemia is just one component. CLTI classification systems prior to Wi-Fi, including TASC, Rutherford, Fontaine, and Peters, to name a few, failed to adequately uh, include all of these components. Uh, for the Wi-Fi classification in the landmark 2014 SVS paper, it was their purpose to refocus the approach to the patient with a threatened limb and component of chronic ischemia according to according disease to severity rather than arterial lesion, lesion classifications. The Wi-Fi classification for CLTI has three components, wound, W, I, uh, ischemia, I, and foot infection, which is so Wi-Fi. Um, while limb perfusion and arterial anatomy are key factors in predicting amputation risk, so too are wound depth and presence and extent of infection. So each of the three components of the Wi-Fi system have four different levels, ranging from zero, which was the least severe, to four, the most severe. With the Wi-Fi definition in place, an expert group, the Delphi consensus group, was asked to assign a limb threat cl uh, clinical stage to each of the 64 theoretical patient combinations that would correlate with a risk of amputation, with stage one being uh, very low and stage four being high. The results of this Delphi consensus process are depicted here. In the uh, top table, um, the consensus for one-year lower extremity amputation for the four quartiles with medical therapy alone is demonstrated with green being the lowest risk category here and red being the highest risk category. In general, risk of amputation was believed to increase as one proceeds down and to the right with increasing severity of each of the individual Wi-Fi score uh, categories. The bottom table, also from the Delphi consensus group, was the estimated likelihood of benefit of revascularization on lower extremity amputation. Uh, external validation of Wi-Fi demonstrated its ability to predict one-year lower extremity amputation rates in patients who were not revascularized. Uh, in the original Wi-Fi paper, however, there were three evidence gaps. 
The first was that no study had attempted to identify which subgroups of patients with CLTI would benefit most from revascularization. The second was that risk stratification in Wi-Fi was originally devised by Delphi consensus instead of modeling in patient data. And the third was that it was unclear which components of Wi-Fi most strongly predicted lower extremity amputation after revascularization. A subsequent paper by Mayer et al. in 2018 addressed these gaps and evaluated the ability of the Wi-Fi classification to identify those patients who would benefit most and least from revascularization. This study evaluated data from 10 centers that had previously published studies on patients with CLTI stratified by Wi-Fi. A total of 1,654 patients were included and cluster analysis was performed to evaluate which combinations of the Wi-Fi scores best predicted lower extremity amputation and revascularization in revascularized patients. Overall, Wi-Fi scores exhibited a median change in lower extremity amputation rate for, uh, from predicted of negative 18.1%. And the majority of uh, presentations had some decrease in lower extremity amputation uh, from predicted with revascularization. The quartile with the greatest benefit from revascularization was compiled compiled of score combinations that tended to have moderate to severe wounds, moderate to severe ischemia, and all grades of infection. Those uh, in the quartile with questionable benefit fell into two general categories, those with small wounds and minimal to no sepsis, and those with severe wounds uh, and or sepsis. Overall, this study showed that the SVS Wi-Fi score can identify which patients will likely benefit from revascularization, that cluster analysis can be used to refine Wi-Fi scoring, and that wound uh, severity is the most predictive component of Wi-Fi for major amputation in revascularized patients. Based on this, um, Hicks et al. evaluated the Wi-Fi revascularization quartiles for diabetic patients uh, with CLTI. Thank you for that excellent background, Dr. Cooper. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, with that, I'll jump into the details of this study. The purpose of this study is to evaluate the previously established revascularization benefit quartiles in diabetic patients with chronic limb-threatening ischemia. The study includes patients treated at a multidisciplinary diabetic foot and wound clinic between the years 2012 and 2020 who had chronic limb-threatening ischemia and underwent revascularization. Exclusion criteria included claudicants, those patients who did not undergo revascularization, and patients with wounds classified as Wi-Fi stage five, which are considered unsalvageable limbs. All patients undergo non-invasive testing at the time of initial presentation, and any with toe pressures of 60 or less proceed to angiography with an intent to revascularize. Revascularization was otherwise reserved for those with non-healing wounds. Subsequently, patients undergo debridement or minor amputation with frequent follow-up in the multidisciplinary clinic and liberal use of home healthcare nursing. Wounds were assigned a Wi-Fi classification at the time of intervention. Each patient was then assigned to the appropriate revascularization benefit quartile as determined by the prior study by Dr. Mayer and colleagues. And just as a reminder, this graph demonstrates the percent change in amputation risk with revascularization previously determined by these quartile distributions. The primary outcome was one year major amputation and secondary outcomes were one year complete foot healing, secondary patency and amputation free survival. 136 patients underwent revascularization of 187 limbs with a median follow up time of 18 months and characteristics of the cohort are seen here. The breakdown of Wi Fi stage classification can be seen here with the majority of wounds classified as Wi Fi stage four at 60%. The distribution of revascularization benefit quartiles is also seen here with 27% in the highest benefit quartile one, 32% in the moderate benefit quartile, 20% in the low benefit, and 21% in the questionable benefit quartile four. Most patients underwent endovascular revascularization. The estimated one-year major amputation rates are seen here. Rates were similar for quartiles one through three, but were significantly higher for quartile four at 26%. Estimated one-year wound healing rates were similar across the four quartiles, though trended toward decreased wound healing in quartile four. One-year secondary patency and amputation-free survival were similar across quartiles. Cox proportional hazard modeling demonstrated a significantly greater risk of major amputation for quartile four compared to quartile one, but no greater risk when comparing quartiles two and three to quartile one. 
Quartile four limbs had a slightly lower hazard ratio for complete foot healing, but this was not significant. And there were no differences in loss of patency or amputation-free survival. At one year follow-up, 16 of 137 limbs required major amputation with nine of these being from the quartile four group. Over half the limbs had patent revascularization at the time of amputation. This shows the distribution of major limb amputation by Wi-Fi scores with amputation being more common among limbs with the most extensive wounds and most severe ischemia. Amputation was not common among those classified with severe foot infection with sepsis, though I presume that is because those patients were probably more likely to undergo immediate amputation and thus would not have been included in this cohort of revascularized patients. This distribution was similar to the findings from the Mayer paper determining the wound classification as the strongest predictor of amputation. This shows the major amputation rates broken down by Wi-Fi clinical stages and by the revascularization benefit quartiles. And the big picture message of this table is that the largest differential in major amputation risk was observed with the revascularization benefit quartiles. Note the observed rates of one year major amputation in this study are much lower across the quartiles than the expected that were previously established. In conclusion, there was a significant association between the revascularization quartile and the need for major amputation in this population of diabetic patients with CLTI, with those in quartile four being at a higher risk of amputation and incomplete wound healing. And these findings support the use of the Wi-Fi benefit of revascularization quartiles for estimating one-year major amputation risk in this patient population. I would like to put forth some questions and points of discussion as we are fortunate to have two of the authors, Dr. Hicks and Dr. Gularaj here to discuss this paper along with Dr. Mills and I believe I saw Dr. Mayer on the call as well. Uh, first, with the recent CLTI guidelines, there is an initiative to pursue evidence-based revascularization according to the PLAN, which stands for Patient Risk, Limb Severity and Anatomic Complexity. The quartile four patients had a significantly higher risk of major amputation, but this rate was still only 29%. If 71% of those questionable benefit patients will avoid amputation with revascularization and excellent wound care, does this really argue against revascularization in this subset of patients? Alternatively, prior studies such as this one out of Loma Linda that looked at VA patients in the PAVE program receiving multidisciplinary wound care suggest that patients with mild to moderate ischemia can have excellent wound healing, here they achieved 77% wound healing without revascularization in this patient cohort in which 87% of the patients were diabetic. A follow-up study from this group also determined that delayed revascularization does not affect the overall outcome of wound healing. The present study did not include patients without revascularization and did not include information on timing of revascularization. So how do we know if and when these patients need revascularization at all? Perhaps this is where the clinical implications of the individual components of the Wi-Fi score, such as those with a wound severity grade of three or ischemia grade of three come into play. And finally, the Hopkins group has done an outstanding job providing excellent multidisciplinary wound care to a patient population with significant resource limitations. Many of us do not have a multidisciplinary clinic such as this. So how do we translate the outcomes of this study to our own diabetic patient population? Thank you so much to Dr. Humphreys and Dr. Demuzio for organizing this journal club and for allowing us to participate this evening. That was really great. Dr. Mills is gonna be our invited discussant to help stimulate conversation, but Dr. Hicks, do you wanna start with her questions? Sure, I can take the tackle the first one and then maybe let uh, Dr. Bularaj grab the second one there. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, thank you, uh, Dr. Reaver, for an, uh, an excellent sort of summary of the study. We went into the study designed after that study by Dr. Mills and Dr. Mayer, um, sort of looking at revascularization benefit quartiles, because one of the original goals of Wi-Fi was not just to predict major amputation risk, but also to sort of be able to triage patients into whether they need a revascularization at all. Um, and so they'd previously shown that that, that was true in, in the population that they looked at, but we have sort of a bit of a unique subset of patients. Um, they're very socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, entirely diabetic. Um, and we do treat them relatively aggressively. So we wanted to see if that sort of concept held within that. Um, you can see that a little bit unlike the original study, we didn't see a big difference across quartiles one through three, but there was sort of that big jump in quartile four. I wouldn't say that the 29% major amputation rate in the quartile four patients um, would suggest at all that those patients should just be going directly to major amputation. I would think of it more as sort of a talking point or a prognostic indicator for people as you're speaking with them 
you know, we've published this before, but the average time to wound healing in these patients is uh, about six months. So if you're talking about a patient that they're going to need a revascularization, they're looking at about six months of aggressive wound care and offloading and repeated clinic visits over and over again, and they have a 30% risk of having a major amputation at the end of that, that may change sort of the, the person's um, individual decision to undergo all of that as opposed to a primary amputation, which in some patients um, is, might be the right move first off. I think Chris will let you talk about the people who don't get revascularized. Yeah, so I think the people who don't get revascularized, it's a little bit hard. You know, a lot of these different things are patient dependent. And it's also a lot about whether you have simple PAD or you have diabetes, right? Because if you have PAD, a lot of these patients have, you know, a lot of collateralization. They don't have angiosomal issues. Um, and the patients that we're sort of dealing with, you know, it's very structured when they come in the workup that they get, and then the decision to revascularize them depends on sort of where they fall in the Wi-Fi. Um, one thing we always look at is the, you know, the screening ABIs and the Doppler waveforms of the PT and the DP, and whether that applies to where their wounds are, because the majority of our patients don't have simple diabetic foot ulcers. They have chronic osteomyelitis with, uh, you know, uh, chronic wound infections that are going to need an amputation. So it's not simply trying to get that wound to heal, it's a matter of realizing that they're going to have an amputation and you have to get that amputation to heal. Um, when you look at that study from Loma Linda, there are a couple of different, uh, pardon me, a couple of differences that um, I would sort of point out. Number one is those are all white males from uh, a VA. We have an equal number of males and females. We also have a large number of African-American patients with diabetes. Now they say they have uh, 80% or 90% of patients with diabetes with an ABI of 0.6. I would say that 99% of our patients have non-compressible vessels. And so we simply follow the toe pressures. Um, that being said, you know, the next thing to question in the comparison to that study is that they had uh, wound healing that happened in approximately four months. Um, yes, that's true, you know, across all stages, but in uh, our Wi-Fi stage four, you know, it happens way longer than that. The other thing is that they define wound healing as complete epithelialization of the wound. In our uh, studies, we define that as not only complete epithelialization, but functional um, normality for up to six weeks. So one of my concerns would be that they had a recurrence rate of 46%, right? So 46% is exceedingly high. Um, and you wonder how many of those recurrences happened within that six weeks. We see that. We never consider it a healed wound, but you know, it's hard to make that comparison. Um, and then finally, you know, if they look, part of me, when they looked at the different procedures that were done, they had amputations, minor amputations that were toes, rays, transmetatarsal amputations, and symes amputations. We have an exceedingly large amount of open amputations and open debridements that are covered with Integra. Uh, and the wound healing rates on those are astronomically higher simply based on, um, you know, secondary intention and ultimately split thickness skin grafts. And so it's a very, very hard comparison to make. I'm not sure that those two papers, um, you know, are, are truly comparable. I would say this, the paper by Dr. Mayer and Dr. Mills um, really, you know, we tried to validate it. You can't validate a paper if part of your patient population is within that paper. Um, you know, obviously we were one of the 10 centers or whatever number of centers um, who submitted data for that. Um, but what we showed was similar to them, that that questionable benefit uh, population really should be looked at. Now, it's not to say that they should not be revascularized. However, um, I agree with Dr. Hicks, you know, basically it's really a, a point to have a better conversation with the patients as to what their outcome may be what the timeline may be and sort of what the risks are. Yeah, Jessica, you were, so Jessica was a general surgery resident with us. She's now a vascular fellow in Pittsburgh, but I'd like her to, I, she was the first author on that paper. And, and so uh, one of the early discussions showed that original Wi-Fi paper, but the thing that's been focused on mostly has been the, the quartiles of amputation prediction, which was its original intent. But the second table below that was this thing we're looking at now is what's the estimated benefit of revascularization. I think that's a really interesting topic. So we, we, we initially 
talked to what, 10 centers or 12 centers and got their data. But then we discovered we couldn't separate out. Some centers included all comers, some included only patients who got revascularized, a few were endo only. So in the end, to get the data to be similar, we had to include only patients who were who revascularized. That's how we, we, so we tried to look at how do those quartiles really match up? And, and if you group them differently, would they be more predictive? So I think we had, how many patients were in that, Jessica? Do you remember roughly? Uh, over 2,800. Yeah, so it's pretty large. So I think what it allowed us to do was separate out the quartiles a little bit more. So one of the advantages you have in your series is you know those patients really well and your data set's complete and you have a standard approach, it's one center. So sometimes of modest, you know, 150 patients from one center, you can get more information out. But the thing you might lose is if you're looking at four quartiles and you're trying to separate out how they behave differently, it might, hard to, might be hard to do because of the numbers. Um, as far as the, how do you use this? I don't think it should be used to deny patients revascularization. But what I do think is that we need to have conversations with these patients and use these tools um, to help them through the process. So if you just tell them you're going to lose your leg if it's not revascularized, regardless of how frail they are, or regardless of how complex the revascularization is, or regardless of how many procedures they're going to take, are you really giving that patient a fair informed consent or not? So if, if they have a 30% chance of losing their leg, and then of those that still have their leg, 10 or 20% still have a wound and they're still coming to clinic at the end of a year. And then by the way, you've bumped some of them off because of multiple interventions. Uh, would they have picked that pathway if you told them all that up front? And so if, we, if we're not honest about this, we'll never get to the, so it's never meant to be exclusionary, but it's meant to give us more data. And I think what I noticed in the Hopkins paper on that far right part of the curve, you know, the, the 64 blocks, that's where almost all, that's a high number of amputations. I think there was five that were like the 333. And the, the uh, Darling paper from Boston that was their series, almost all their amputations were in that group. So if we can validate that from lots of centers, there, there probably is a subset, that 333 group, that probably does, might do better with a guillotine foot amputation than a BK and be done with it rather than flogging them. But I'm really excited to see um, Wi-Fi use like this because I think it gives us more... Um, it's a lot more granular than what we had before, right? Basically every wound that was potentially healable or could have a transmet was a Rutherford five and Rutherford six was supposed to mean you had to do a Chopar, a Liz Frank or something less than a TMA, right? But that term got abused for years. So basically we were studying Rutherford five patients and then they're different as, as Chris pointed out, diabetics are different, right? They're prone to recurrence because of neuropathy and because of their, their, um, <clears throat> their potential for infection. So in your series, I think over half the patients that lost their leg had a patent vascular reconstruction at the time they lost their leg. So that shows you there's other factors involved. It's not just the revask part. And that was, that was part of the purpose of Wi-Fi. It was actually meant to encourage more aggressive revascularization because the, the grades one and two ischemia don't meet the standard definition of what we called CLI for a long time. And yet we know that some of those patients, so a diabetic with an ABI of 0.68 and a toe pressure of 30, 35, they might well benefit from revask, right? But they don't meet this strict DLI definition. But anyway, I think that's great work from your group. And I admire the way I like to see groups build multidisciplinary uh, pathways to help these patients because that's the way forward. I could just add that because very, oh, sorry, yeah, go Caitlin, for if I could interrupt you for two seconds. If I, I'd love to ask uh, Joe a quick question. You know, the Wi Fi classification uh, upgraded the wound for a heel wound. And it's been our experience that even heel calcaneal osteomyelitis is actually treatable. We lose on uh, osteomyelitis of the midfoot. So has there ever been any discussion in terms of like regrading the wounds um, to address that in diabetic patients? Have you seen that? Is that your experience as well? And then, you know, obviously as a written discussion. I, I think midfoot and hindfoot wounds are different. So you don't usually see those in non-diabetics, but you do in diabetics. And I think those are the patients that can have, um, if you're an angiosome zealot, you think it's angiosomal. I just call it a um, regional blood flow abnormality in the foot. So a lot of, I've seen a lot of patients with profound heel ischemia that have normal toe waveforms. So their AT and DP are intact and they have no perineal and no posterior tip. And so um, they're different. And if you look at some of the series that break out different wounds by locations. It's true that midfoot and hindfoot wounds tend to do worse than forefoot wounds. 
Anyway, when we first did Wi-Fi, the hardest thing to come up with was the wound classification. There was a lot of debate and I was never sure we would reach consensus because some of the diabetologists didn't agree with the vascular surgeons and it got to be, and, it, and despite that, it worked out pretty well. Like if you look at your series and also the paper Jessica wrote, that was the initial wound grade was the highest predictor of success, right? Because the ischemia you can almost often correct unless they're a desert foot. And infection, if you can drain it and there's still enough tissue left in the foot to support a functional foot, you can win there. But you can't change the wound that came to you, right? That, that's, that makes sense, actually. Um, no, but I think I'm hesitant to regrade Wi-Fi until we get more data from more centers and look at what we have. But I think it needs to be, it probably will need to be adjusted. And I also would like to find a way to maybe get to three stages. I think that one and four clearly separate out in almost every study I've seen. The twos and threes overlap a lot. Um, and some, I think some of the twos are actually ones and some of the threes are actually fours. So if we study this more, we may be able to come up with a little bit simpler system. But I think the app, I think Dr. Glavitsky was spearheaded the initial app that put out Wi-Fi, but now we, the app now includes the mortality calculator and also glass. I think that's gonna give us a really great way to get people together to collect data. Just look at all those tools and see you know, so we can give a better discussion to the patient and a better estimate of what, what's it going to take to save this limb? How many operations are you likely to have? What's the success rate going to be? And then it's a more it's a more informed choice, I think. Sort of dovetailing into that, actually, sort of the, the rethinking of, of Wi-Fi. I actually wonder about giving an upgrade for ischemia score for people with diabetes. Um, I think, you know, there's more and more data that the toe pressures of 60 and some people are just not adequate. We see it a lot. So you know, Dr. Weaver mentioned in our sort of process, when people come in and if they have a toe pressure greater than 60, we do a trial of wound care, but a lot of those fail. Uh, like a, we find that a lot of them under 80 end up at going to an angiogram. So I just wonder if we're sort of missing that the diabetics need a little bit more inflow because they have, so, they do have microvascular disease in the foot. And I mean, there's, there is some data to support that. Yeah, maybe most of the, most of that 55, 60 number actually came from diabetics. For non-diabetics, I mean, you'll think I'm crazy, but I have a bunch of patients. I had a guy that was really frail with complex multi-level calcified disease, and he had this big topus on his toe that got infected from gout and eroded through his toe. And he had barely pulsatile toe waveforms. I just took his toe off, he was non-diabetic, and it healed completely. So I think, I think non-diabetics can actually heal with much less than 60. Whether or not it takes more than that, I think it depends on the combination of the wound and neuropathy and other stuff. But anyway, even with Wi-Fi, so if, if you do that four to six week trial and you're not making progress, then there's only two issues you can address is, is there underlying infection you've missed that needs to be drained or treated differently? Or are you missing ischemia? So I would never say don't get an angiogram ever on a, on a clinical stage, a low, you know, something that seems to have normal perfusion. It's a screening test, right? It puts you in the likelihood you're gonna have to do something. It's not absolute. But we, we tend to get pretty good healing. If we can get pulsatile toe waveforms back and their pressures are in the 40s, 50s, 60s, they usually heal. I haven't seen that many with, with pulsatile toe waveforms and a pressure over 60 that have trouble with a forefoot wound. The hind foot, mid foot's different because again, your toe pressure doesn't always reflect the mid foot and hind foot perfusion. I think that's oh, the big weakness. Of, yeah, of I was gonna say one of the things Dr. Dr. Lawrence mentioned is about dissemination. You know, Wi-Fi is big in this circle. Wi-Fi is something that's being used in vascular centers and multidisciplinary centers. But Dr. Lawrence brings up a really great point. And this is part of you know, the VISTA grant that I'm working with. None of our wound care centers are using Wi-Fi. And how do we change that? Yeah, I think is, is, is promulgating the message, right? So the Europeans pretty much have adopted it. The Japanese have adopted it. The UK has been a little hesitant for two reasons. One, they have this system called Sinbad which they use for auditing their results. And the sole assessment of ischemia in Sinbad is whether the practitioner who's seeing the patient thinks they feel a foot pulse. And if they think they feel a foot pulse, there's no further vascular testing. And I'm convinced that's a big mistake because you're gonna miss patients and you certainly don't want their whole care to rely on some random practitioner's palpation of a foot pulse. Absolutely. Um, but and one I think, way, I don't know yeah. how you're trying to do it. We're, we're trying different ways to give outreach to places. I would love to set up virtual clinics where I tried to do this when I was in Arizona with the Native Americans, but Native American politics is complicated because there's different tribes and some are federal, some are individual. And so you have to talk to 50 people to arrange anything like this. But I was wanting to, we'd get patients air in 
as an emergency with an infected toe and bounding foot pulses, and they were sent for revascularization. And then we get somebody else that had one toe taken off, it didn't heal, another toe taken off because they had pulses, and they come down and they have flat toe waveforms and a horrible tibial disease. So I was trying to come up with a way to screen those people. So if they got a foot x-ray, a white count, and you had Doppler waveforms of their forefoot toes, you could probably make a good educated guess about who would do well with their local podiatrist and who might need to come. That would be a huge, if we could do that through your grant or Dr. Kempke's grant or what we're trying to do in Harris Health, that would be a big step forward. But I think there's been a lot of adoption of it. It's the, the wound care centers, not so much. They, they're driven by, until the reimbursement changes, they're driven by hyperbarics, right? So they're looking for a reason to dive a patient. Well, checking Doppler to, Doppler waveforms should, I think, become a quality measure for people presenting with diabetic foot wounds. And I mean, that's the way you would change it. If that's a quality measure in anyone presenting with a diabetic foot wound, they'd all get it. We would change the paradigm. People would be aware of it. And it, people would be incentivized to do it because you're going to get dinged if you don't. And I think we do a lot of talking about screening for PAD, which is sort of largely irrelevant because we treat yeah. that medically the same way we do other things, but we don't treat diabetic foot ulcers the same way. And I think that would be a much more important metric for, for us and, and the wound care centers and, and primary care physicians as well. That, that's Listen, a there are two things brilliant that... point. Go ahead, Chris, I'm sorry. Sorry, I would just say there are two things. I mean, SVS guidelines for diabetic feet is that everyone should get screened with ABIs, right? So not all wound care centers are doing that. The second thing is that it should be disseminated to podiatrists, right? Because the majority of wound care centers are driven by podiatrists. Um, we, you know, at the SVS, there's always the... Um, the combined podiatry uh, lower extremity session. Um, it should be stressed at that. And then it should not only go from the SVS to their, it should go to their APMA meetings as well. Um, because I think that's where our loss is. You know, if we can combine with them, then it should be disseminated very, very easily. Well, there was a lot of great discussion, a lot. I know that, you know, it's a little after six. Thank you everybody for staying afterwards to, to have these conversations because it's really great topics and a lot of, of questions and more research that needs to be done. Um, for everyone, remember we will be doing it again. We do it monthly, second week of the month generally. So the next one will be November 9th and we look forward to having everybody here. Have a great night. Thank you everybody to all our presenters and to our authors for being here and of course our discussants. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks so much guys. Bye. Thanks. Good night.